Welcome everyone to the first lecture of our spring series. My name is Betsy Gardner and I am the president of this fabulous organization. Um, I have several announcements and the first is the most important. Please, please, please turn off your cell phones. The other thing I want to remind people of and tell people that uh, about if you're new is following the lecture there is a question and answer period. And I know that um, this is an intelligent audience and you have lots of interesting uh, questions. We all want to hear them. So save them for the Q&A and wait for a microphone. There will be someone on this side, someone on that side who will carry a portable microphone so we can all um, listen. The other thing I want to remind you of is our website. We do have a website and it's a good idea to check it now and then um, for um, information about forthcoming lectures, but also in case for some reason there is a change in the schedule or something is canceled. Last semester we unfortunately had to cancel one lecture and we hate to do that. This is our spring semester but this is <laughs> February 1st. <laughs> so, um, so always check and then in the brochure there is um, my number which is listed. You can always call my number or on the website you can call. Um, they'll give you some information so you'll have a person to call. And um, purposely, if you remember, I told you last semester, we did not put emails and phone numbers down for everyone because of being scammed. Yeah. Um, our publicity chairman is Dorothy Lovering, and she asked me to request you to help her out. We're looking for volunteers who are familiar with Front Page Forum. If you are and you're willing to post um, information about the week's lecture and you post on Monday or early Tuesday, um, it would be a very big help to us and we will even give you a script and all the information She is not here today, that's why. And so um, if anyone is interested in, in helping us out that way, um, see me after the lecture and I will get your name and information and pass it on to Dorothy. I, I do it for my section and it's pretty easy. Um, the other thing I would like you to, um, to think about is taking extra brochures with you. Um, we send, um, we sent out brochures to 21 libraries. And if you're in a local library, look around and see if they have our brochures out and if they, they might be out of them. If they're out of them, please let us know. Um, because publicity is what keeps us um, growing and it keeps you guys coming. So thank you very much and now I'm very happy who have Beth Woods come and introduce our speaker, and um, wonderful to have her back. Well, welcome to our second semester, our new semester, and on behalf of the program committee, we hope you'll enjoy our programs again this semester. It's with great pleasure that I welcome back Pablo Bose as our kickoff speaker. And Pablo was born in India, raised in Canada. He is a graduate, uh, received his PhD at York University in Toronto. He joined the faculty at the University of Vermont in 2006. And he is currently an associate professor of geography and director of the Global and Regional Studies program at UBM. He also chairs the university's diversity curriculum committee. One of his main areas of research is migration and refugee resettlement, and that's what he's here to share with us today. So with great pleasure, please welcome back Pablo Bose. Thank you so much. Well, 
You're okay, let me know if the... Yeah, um, so thank you so much. Uh, I think this is my third lecture here. I've enjoyed it um, a great deal coming and speaking to you. I think the first lecture I gave was on refugee resettlement uh, last fall on India, and I thought I would choose a really non-controversial uh, <laughs> subject that no one is talking about today. Um, <clears throat> So immigration is, uh, as Beth mentioned, one of the main uh, focus points of my own work. Um, I'm a migration scholar. I study cities. I study cities in change, primarily affected by migration. Uh, I look at refugee resettlement all across the world. I've been looking at it here in the US for the last 10, 12 years. Um, I've also been looking at it in Canada. I'll talk a little bit about that uh, here. And I've expanded this work over the last a uh, couple of years now to look at um, migration issues in different parts of Europe, primarily in Scandinavia and in Germany, and primarily in the same way that here in the U.S. I've been looking at kind of non-traditional sites that uh, migrants and refugees, primarily refugees, have been going to. I'm sort of looking at similar kinds of things in Europe as well. Um, I also talk about this from the perspective of having been an immigrant um, in two different countries, so having uh, been born in India, as you heard, and then uh, immigrating to Canada when I was uh, young with my parents, and then uh, moving here to the U.S. as an adult. And so I've seen all sorts of different kind of aspects of this, both through my own research, but also through my uh, lived experience. This is, I would say, one of the primary areas of interest for many of our students uh, up on campus uh, these days, uh, looking at different ways in which they can get involved or simply understand what is going on. And so I cannot pretend to understand all of the things that are going on um, in the world of immigration, but I want to share today uh, some of the things that uh, I have been looking at. I'm realizing this screen is not super large, so uh, I'll probably read some of these things. So there's three main things that I wanted to talk about today. The first is about uh, migration across the globe. So some of what we're seeing uh, as trends and, and uh, patterns, and in particular, the backlash against uh, immigration and migration. And that's something that we see in parts of the US and some, uh, something that we also see uh, across the world more generally. Um, I've sort of said that in terms of just backlash, but I also uh, I want to reiterate, and my whole sort of last example will talk about uh, not just backlash, but welcome. Uh, one of my uh, thesis students right now is writing a really interesting uh, senior thesis about her experiences being in Germany during her study abroad. And she's writing about this kind of clash between uh, what's called welcome culture and uh, the sort of rising xenophobia. Um, I'm not going to talk as much about, uh, well, you'll see both sides of that in this presentation. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about um, kind of what's going on in the U.S. today, uh, just a little bit about that. And then I'm going to end with a case study looking at um, the response to the Syrian refugee crisis, um, both in the U.S. and in Canada. So just to begin with, um, when we're talking about migration, uh, there's a lot of different terms, a lot of different ways in which people talk about migrants, and I'm going to unpack a little bit of that. So right now when we talk about migration, uh, we're talking about pe people living outside of their country of origin or citizenship. That, that can be a little bit uh, tricky uh, which definition you use. Um, however, some people will talk about uh, the current age as being the age of migration. We've had other periods of mass movements of people, of goods, of capital, of ideas, um, of labor. Uh, but in many ways today, it's talked about as the age of migration. In 2000, there were 173 million people who would fall into this category of living outside of their country of origin across the globe. By 2018, that's at 258 million people. So the scale of this has really, really ramped up uh, over the past two decades. Um, in 2050, the projections back in the early 2000s, based on those numbers, uh, was that there would be 230 million people uh, by 2050 uh, living outside their country of origin. As you can see, we've already surpassed that number, and the revised projection last year was that there will be 400 million people living outside of their country of origin. Now, these are all large numbers, and you know, again, the scale is growing a great deal. At the same time, I want to emphasize that migrants as a percentage of the global population, 
is about 3%. Right? So it's still a, a fairly small percentage of the overall world's population who are either immigrants or migrants of, of different kinds. Um, one of the challenges, I, I think, is that today we try to think about this process of migration, which is an age-old human phenomenon. People move for all kinds of different reasons. But we now put modern constructions like borders or passports or, or sort of national boundaries down, uh, many of which cut across uh, these routes that people have taken for a long, long time. Some of the categories through which we uh, see migration, one of the big ones is economic migration. So that's people moving for, um, for work, so labor migration is a big one. But again, there you have a, a huge disparity in different kinds of labor migration. We have low-skilled um, seasonal or um, irregular migration. We have semi-skilled migration. Um, and then there's professional class uh, migration. If you were to look at the Gulf countries, for example, uh, and you look at the main flow of people that are coming into the, uh, the Gulf for work, you have lots of domestic labor. You have manual labor that's coming from places like Bangladesh and uh, Malaysia. But then you also have lots of highly skilled engineers, doctors, uh, and other professionals coming from uh, parts of India, Pakistan, et cetera. You also have guest workers, so people either uh, coming on a temporary or a more permanent basis. You have migrants who are going because of educational reasons, either on a shorter or longer term uh, reason. And something that until recently didn't seem to be, actually no, I won't say it's only recently become a, a dirty word, but the idea of family reunification, which has been the backbone of much of modern uh, immigration and migration um, patterns and policies, uh, is really the largest flow of migrants um, in the world. So some of the different categories, uh, again, most of what I just showed before was reasonably optional migration. So people who actually wanted to, um, is it, no. Um, people who, who have the option in some way of migrating. The other big category, the one that we tend to see a lot more on television, is really forced migration. So people who don't really have the option. Um, so refugees are the category that is most recognized by um, international law, by uh, most nation states. People who are um, kind of authorized to be in another country because they can't stay in their own. There are others who are similarly um, displaced, but they might not be displaced outside of their country. So they're displaced within. So if you look at the population of Syria, um, there are um, well over half that uh, country's population has been displaced. But roughly half of that number is outside of Syria. The other half is inside. Um, asylum seekers, we obviously have heard a lot about asylum seekers at the southern border from Central America. Um, that's a little bit different. If you're an official refugee, you've already been vetted and approved. Um, asylum seekers show up and they ask for sanctuary, so it's a little bit of a different uh, process. And finally, stateless persons, so that would be like the Rohingya or some of the Kurdish populations, people who don't really have um, access to citizenship and are said to be not from the country that they're actually in anymore. The reasons for leaving are really varied. It might be a natural disaster, um, environmental uh, degradation, resource extraction, um, development projects have displaced lots of people. So things like dams, railroads, things like that. And of course, conflict and persecution is one of the main um, ways in which we think of this. So there's lots of people on the move to go into many different places, in some cases new places, in some cases old. But the reception that they're receiving is, um, is really, has always been uh, kind of tempered. There's been all kinds of ways in which uh, immigrants have been welcomed into certain societies. Uh, but there are all kinds of ways in which they have not. And I'll, I'll kind of call back to um, some of that historical um, trends before. But we're in a moment right now where since the end of the Cold War and the sort of end of history, as some people would put it, um, you know, since the sort of the ascendancy of global capitalism and this new age of globalization where apparently there's no more borders and people and goods and trade will just flow across borders, there's been this kind of rising sense that, well, immigration is probably good. 
it is a general kind of good. This isn't widely accepted everywhere, but what we've really seen over the last three to five years is a generally uh, kind of populist notion that actually immigration is not good. This is not to say that this came about uh, in the last five years, but it's been given much more um, popular expression. And we see it especially in a lot of the countries of the global north, of the west, of the north, in North America and Europe, places that have been for um, certainly a few decades uh, one of the, the big sort of um, pillars of kind of global migration flows. Lots of people have been going to wealthier countries, countries with more jobs or more opportunity in different ways. And yet what we've started to see is a lot more of this. So in France, um, in uh, Italy, we've seen the rise of uh, especially right-wing populist parties that have at their core one thing that sort of holds them in common, and that is an anti-immigrant uh, kind of platform. Um, in many ways, they are distinguished by all sorts of other things there that they don't have in common with one another. But the one thing that sort of holds them together is this notion that um, that there has been too much immigration in their country. Take Brexit, for example. There are lots of different things that have uh, that underpin the um, support for Brexit amongst those who voted to leave. You could look at underdevelopment of, um, of Britain outside of some of the major cities. You could look at a long-standing kind of Euroscepticism about you know, the power of Brussels and this and that. But there's been a lot of really interesting studies that have talked about the rise of anti-immigrant sentiment in Britain that is really tied to the enlargement of the EU in 2004. The anti-immigrant sentiment uh, uh, that's kind of um, surrounded Brexit is really directed at um, Polish and Romanian immigrants, many of whom come over after that 2004 enlargement of the EU and, uh, and other Eastern European, Central Europeans. Um, and they fill a lot of these service sector jobs, in particular in the UK, where they're really needed, especially outside of um, the metropolitan core. And so, Again, I'm not going to get into the insanity that is Brexit and what they think they are going to be able to get out of the EU. I have an easy answer, nothing. Um, there is no leverage. Anyway, I'm, okay, I'm going to leave that. Um, but in France, um, we have seen anti-immigrant uh, protests that have um, gotten swept up. And then, again, there's lots of other things that are going on. There's um, a long-standing um, social inequality and tensions, especially around um, uh, Muslim minority in France, which is one of the largest um, growing minority populations. Um, you know, uh, the, the spate of terrorist attacks. There's a lot of different kind of cultural um, anxieties, what it means to be French, um, especially in a society, as you'll see with within a lot of these European examples, and then I would argue also in the US, it's really about a lot of anxiety about demographic change and what does it mean to be one, uh, a person living in one of these countries. Um, in Germany, again, wide uh, and large scale protests, protest marches. Um, again, we see these in much greater numbers in the eastern part of Germany, where uh, former East Germany, where again, we can ask questions about underdevelopment or uneven development. Poland, Denmark, um, Sweden and Finland. Um, and here we have three of the countries that have, uh, the, uh, three of the Nordic countries that have been, certainly in terms of refugees, one of the largest per capita uh, resettlers of refugees. Uh, uh, Sweden and uh, Denmark effectively shut down their refugee programs um, in the last few years. Um, and yet, again, as I said, there's a lot of uh, complexity that underlies a lot of these populist parties. The true Finns, for example. You know, you'll hear a lot about the rise of the, the far right, and this is a, a, a trend in many different places. But you know, the true Finns and some of the, the other anti-immigrant parties um, the, uh, the coalition in Italy, for example, you actually have some fairly progressive kind of policies articulated by these, pol uh, by these parties about 
um, family leave or you know medical uh, health access, um, uh, many other things. But the idea there is we want to have these kinds of social programs only for the people who are legitimate citizens of the country. So it's really a nativist kind of argument, um, and it doesn't always align with other things. We get these kinds of messages really in ways that uh, I think shock a lot of people, that all of a sudden in places that have had more of a, um, a reputation for being more uh, welcoming, we start to see messages like this. This is in Slovakia. Here is another one. I'm, uh, where is this? Any guesses? It's in Canada. Um, so this is in you know the the warm and fuzzy home of multiculturalism and all the rest. Um, and here you see also the ways in which some of these different movements speak to each other and echo one another. So this is in Edmonton, um, and it's a protest uh, that draws on the yellow ja yellow vest protests in France. And again. Um, this has also been at the heart of you know, Canada's largest province, Ontario, elected a premier who ran on, in large part, an anti-migrant uh, policy at the provincial level, saying there's too many refugees uh, coming to Toronto. It's not just in countries of the global north, sorry, you probably can't see this all that well, but um, here we have on the bottom, this is in South Africa, stop illegal immigrants. Uh, fake refugees go home, that's in South Korea. Um, this is an anti-immigrant protest in Brazil, a pro-Bolsonaro protest. Uh, and in, in the bottom corner there, Singapore for Singaporeans. And you can look at country after country across the, the world, and really what's noticeable is this kind of this rise of this nativist sentiment. So once again, there is some group out there that is doing something to you. They are stealing jobs, they are whatever it is there is a, a grievance that is um, sort of deeply, deeply held against them. So, so I'll get kind of into why I think this is happening. But one of the other things that we're seeing right now articulated very clearly is this idea that we have to do something. So what is the something that we can do to stop immigration, migration? Uh, and again, I'll get to the, the problem in a moment. And the one big one, of course, we've heard a lot about is the idea of the wall. So walls, again, make a lot of sense for people who don't understand geography, security, mostly anything. I mean, like if you want to stop migration, this is not an effective way to do it. This has never been an effective way to do it. I'll put aside the, the, the question of whether or not you want to stop migration. But it, let's say you really do want to do it. It doesn't actually, that's not what happens. And it's also kind of a fiction that well, there are many fictions, but the fiction that it's an incredibly porous border and you, know, you can get across it, of course that's true because a line on a map doesn't look the same as a border on the ground. It never has. Um, you know, I mean, post 9-11 there have been attempts to actually draw mostly the nor northern border. Right? We have large, large stretches of the northern border where you couldn't build a wall unless you moved the border, right? Like, uh, unless it, you, know, you cut through lakes or you cut through forests. You actually have money in Homeland Security budgets every year to deforest uh, parts of the, the border to actually demarcate. This is where the border is. Um, and the reality is that over time, what we've done in the US is and not just the US, but other places as well. If we look at all the crossings of the Mediterranean to try to reach asylum, we don't stop people from actually making those journeys. We just make them much more dangerous. And so that's what we've actually done, is we've pushed people into more and more and more dangerous crossings. And the initial intent of that would be, we're gonna make it dangerous enough. We're gonna make it terrible enough. We're gonna steal people's kids. We're gonna put them, make them cross a desert, cross a, an ocean in a terrible dinghy, and that's going to stop them. But unfortunately, it, it doesn't stop them because, and you know, I, I always think about this, the, I went to a bread and puppet uh, show, I remember a couple of years ago, and they performed, they had a whole thing about the Mediterranean crossings, and they read from this poem by um, the poet um, uh, Harshan Ali Shir, and 
And there's a line in it where it said, how dangerous must the land be for you to put your child onto that boat? And that's what I always think about, is that when people make these kinds of journeys, there's often this sense of, oh, well, it's just, people are just being economic migrants, and that is not, that's not enough of a reason. That's, and um, there's always been an arbitrary nature of this kind of categorization. My own family, um, when my family fled across the border to uh, what is now India from what, was, what is now Bangladesh, um, they were fleeing horrific violence. The, there's no question about it. You know, 40 members of my family killed and you know, all of the rest of this. But they were recognized as refugees for those two years. My family had wealth and capital and the ability to make that, that journey. Anybody who came, so it was as long as you were crossing between 1946 and 1948, anybody who came after 1948 was classified as an economic migrant even though most likely the reasons that people couldn't cross was they didn't have the, the means to. So a lot of times these sorts of um, attempts we make to categorize and to kind of uh, close people off, they make very little, uh, very little sense on the ground. And yet, again, it's not just the US that builds walls. So we see walls in Israel-Palestine. Um, the great anxiety in India is always in India's northeast, and the great anxiety is always um, Bangladesh. And so there's these miles and miles and miles of new fencing that have gone up uh, all across the border. Um, as some politicians have pointed out, walls are a medieval uh, contraption. And as we know from the Great Wall of China and Hadrian's Wall, they don't work. If you're trying to keep the Mongols out, it did not work. It certainly didn't keep the Picts and the Scots and, and the others out. It is, however, a really good investment if you're thinking like the long game and you're thinking in a couple hundred years, if we need a really good tourist attraction, <laughs> this is something you, so again, maybe it's just like just really high level thinking and I'm missing it. Um, but there are other ways in which uh, we have seen an increasing number of um, restrictions on uh, immigration. So we've seen an increasing number of travel bans, visa restrictions, lots of things that have slowed down the journey of people from point A to point B. Uh, again, this is in the context of the US. Um, so the travel bans that we saw that were temporarily blocked and then allowed to proceed. But even before that, we have all kinds of visa restrictions that come, uh, come about. And again, most countries um, will use this in different uh, ways. We've seen incarceration and deportation here in the US even before um, uh, the Trump administration. Under the Trump administration, the kinds of targeting of wide groups of immigrants um, has really grown. But under the Obama administration, especially the second administration, there was a real spike in uh, deportation and incarceration, and especially the use of privatized prisons um, for immigration uh, enforcement. Uh, however, we also see similar kinds of things in other places. I mentioned the Gulf before. The Gulf countries are sort of notorious. Every time there are different kinds of um, ups and downs in the global economy, there is the cancellation of visa programs, especially from poorer uh, sort of immigrant labor countries in uh, South Asia. So there's lots of different ways in which um, migration is, is attempted to be um, slowed down and stopped. So a lot of why this is going on, um, and some of this is, you know, it takes different kinds of uh, manifestations in different places. But there's a bunch of different things that we kind of hear about when we think about um, immigration and migration all over the world. One very common um, sort of discourse is about a great flood. You hear about this all the time. There are so many migrants. We're in an emergency. We're in an emergency which apparently is really slow moving. It's a national emergency of slow moving. I, 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 actually, I actually want to say that I do think it's important to think smartly about if you believe in the idea of a nation state, you should think about what a border looks like and what border security looks like. But there are ways in which you diagnose problems that actually exist, and then there are ways of throwing enormous amounts of money and resources towards fantasies that 
will not actually help you deal with real public policy problems. Um, so the first one is that there is not really a great flood of migrants. Uh, there's some really interesting polling data that shows across the world in most uh, kind of immigrant destination countries, you know, wealthier countries in Europe and North America. If you poll the um, residents in most of these countries, almost everybody thinks everyone else in every other country wants to come there. Whether you are um, surveying people in Portugal, Poland, the US, or whatever, everybody thinks everybody wants to come to their country. And that is true in some cases, but it is not true in most. Most people they have an attachment to where it is that they live. Now, certainly the, you know, the opportunity to better your life is a really, really big one. But the, the actual trade-offs are really big. I remember when I first returned to India as an adult or as a young adult with my father and I saw my extended family and all of these networks and all of these things they had and I said, how could you leave this? I, I really didn't understand why they would have left this. And they, they said to me they mainly left because of my sister and that they really felt that my sister would not have the same kind of opportunity growing up in India that she would have had in Canada. And my father also said, yeah, all these relatives at, at some time, they get a little annoying. So <laughs> that was my father though. Um, but there are other reasons, other things that we hear about around <laughs> immigration in sending countries. The big concern is a very different one than the thing that we hear in the countries that receive immigrants, which is about drain, a brain drain, which is about the idea that what happens if all the best and brightest of your country, perhaps uh, people that you have educated um, at you know, public expense, then go elsewhere. I mean, we talk about that in a, in a kind of a micro way here in a place like Vermont, uh, where if you have uh, youth out migration, what does that mean for, um, for that place as a whole? But overall, you know, the real challenge is about demographic change. In a lot of these places that immigrants are going to now, um, what you're really seeing is a shift in location. For the majority of the modern age of migration, immigrants have gone to cities. They've gone to big gateway cities. But that, for at least 20, 30 years, that pattern has changed. Now people have been going to, uh, so in the US for example, it used to be that immigrants went to six states. Texas, California, Florida, New York. This is a question on my, no, it's, it's New Jersey and, oh, Illinois, sorry, right. This is a question on my final for my students, so I, re <laughs> I should really, I really should know that. Um, and within those states, they go to the large cities, large metropolitan cities, the New Yorks, the Chicago's, uh, and later on, LA and places like that, San Francisco. Um, but for the last 20, 30 years, that pattern has been changing. You have newer places uh, in the south, in the Midwest. You have places that used to be immigrant hubs that are reappearing. Somebody said Minneapolis or Minnesota. You know, that used to be in the 19th century an immigrant destination, and then it really wasn't for a long time, and it is again now. So what you're experiencing in a lot of these places is significant demographic change, um, especially if you look at rural areas. And again, this is very similar in Scandinavia and Germany and in France um, and here. You're having an out-migration of younger populations and you're having an in-migration of mostly immigrant populations. Bowling Green, Kentucky, a city I went to a couple of years ago to do some research, and um, the city manager started off by saying to me, I may have said this in a previous talk, he started off by saying, I'm a good old uh, boy from a, uh, an old white southern town. And I thought, wow, uh, this is going off the rails really fast. <laughs> and he said the best thing that ever happened to our city was getting immigrants. And in their case, it's Latino labor migrants and uh, refugees. But it was really interesting that there is a town that went from, in 1990, had a foreign-born population of 0.5%. By 2000, it was 5%. By 2010, it was 10%. And by 2015, it was 15%. That is a huge shift in a very short amount of time. And it raises what a lot of scholars will say. I mean, in the US, it's really been about um, a shift in Latino labor migrants coming into lots of places they weren't before. Um, in different parts of like amenity uh, places, ski resorts and, and um, resort towns and um, 
into agriculture, into lots of different places that you just haven't seen the volume of people before. And so the, the anxieties you hear about, the effects on culture, people being so invested in, like, you know, why is somebody speaking this language? Why are they wearing this kind of religious uh, garb, et cetera? Uh, and so you see other kinds of pushback. So you see in Quebec, you know, a ban on wearing religious headscarves, or in France, or in Germany, or lots of places. Um, the effect on jobs, again, you know, it's a, a quick um, sort of response to say, well, you know, this is going to mean that our young people aren't going to get jobs, except we are in a very, very healthy economy right now. Well, at least a, on paper, a, a pretty full employment economy. Um, so the other questions that come up, security, especially with all of the sort of issues around terrorism, have been a a pretty significant and legitimate question. At the same time, you know, there is very little evidence. Take refugees, for example. Three million refugees uh, resettled in the U.S. since 1980. Uh, roughly, I think, three, uh, five convictions for terrorism. Um, so it's a pretty, that's pretty good evidence that the vetting actually works um, effectively. And crime, you hear about this all the time. Um, well, immigrants are bringing crime, and yet there is no evidence. In fact, what we see is that immigrants in the U.S. Um, uh, commit crimes at far lower rates than uh, the native-born population. As I said before, this is not new. Uh, I just wanted to read a couple of quotes here. I realize this is way too small, so I'll read it. Um, this is Benjamin Franklin talking about Germans. Unless the stream of their importation could be turned, they will soon so outnumber us that all the advantages we have will not be able to preserve our language and even our government will become precarious. This is John Jay speaking of Catholics. We should build a wall of brass around the country. <laughs> this is John Passos speaking of, uh, about Jewish populations. The people of this country are too tolerant. There's no other country in the world where they'd allow it. After all, we built up this country and then we allow a lot of foreigners, the scum of Europe, the offscourings of Polish ghettos to come and run it for us. So again, there, there's a long tradition. I always say, like, yes, the U.S. has a long tradition of being an immigrant country. Also, also has a long tradition of not particularly liking immigrants. Not everyone, but that, that strain remains. And again, we see this in Australia. Australia had an explicit policy in the 1920s called White Australia. Canada, in the, 19, in the late 19th century, early 20th century, the Department of Interior had what they called the Great Chain of Race where they had at the bottom all the Asiatic races, Africans, and at the top they had, any guesses? Who do they put at the very top? What? Brits, Brits sort of. A, a uh, Scottish peasant with a sturdy wife is at the, <laughs> is at right at the top of the list. Um, so, you know, another thing here to think about when we think about what's going on, these debates in the U.S around immigration. Um, just to give some context, again, there, in 1965, there were 10 million immigrants in the US. 1965 is when we um, revamped the, the immigration system in the US. Between the 1920s and 1965, there had been restrictions, uh, significant restrictions, basically to stop less um, sort of Asian immigrants than Eastern European and Jewish immigrants. That's really what that was aimed at in the 1920s. Um, there were 10 million immigrants in 1965 in the U.S. There are 45 million today, including their descendants, meaning second and third generation. That's generally what's uh, counted as descendants in these figures, 72 million. By 2065, a projected 103 million um, immigrants or immigrant descendant populations, and it's 88% of population growth. So the bulk of the growth of the U.S. Uh, population over this period is, is projected to be immigrants um, out of a projected 441 million. But the other thing I wanted to emphasize, so this is from a Pew Research Center um, ex extensive survey in July 2015. Uh, immigrant effect on society, 45% of respondents had positive, 37% negative. Immigrants as a burden uh, as a strength, not burden, 51% not uh, positive, 41% negative. Um, and when we look at specific immigrant perceptions, some of them are very low, especially of Middle Eastern, African immigrants, 
but even Asian and European, there are only 44% positive uh, perceptions of uh, European immigrants. Um, does it make the crime or economy worse? 50% said it made it worse. Uh, moral and social values in schools are worse, 34 and 41 percent. The system needs to be changed, 54 percent. Immigration needs to be decreased, 49 percent. So a lot of times when people look at the current moment and say, like, you know, Trump is worse than the, the conversation or you know, all of these kinds of things, that may all well be true. But it's also very true that where there are all kinds of things that I don't think Trump taps into or you know there's different things that different people might want judges or you know this or that I actually think that he tapped into a, a fairly widespread anxiety about immigration and this holds through when you look at voting patterns across the country um, there's some again New York Times really interesting um, um, kind of visualizations that show where um, high sort of Trump voting districts have been and how touched they are or not by immigration. So it's pretty interesting. One of the big questions that's often raised is about immigration costs, and certainly that's, that's I think, a, a valid uh, question to raise. So when we look, 51% of immigrant-headed households in 2016 use at least one federal welfare program compared to 47% of the native-born population. So not a huge disparity, but it is there. Um, however, when we look at this, again, taking the longer view, uh, most immigration scholars would say you have to look at the second and third generation because we see a movement out of that kind of dependency fairly quickly in immigrant households. So um, the 2011 to 2013 net cost to state and local budget, $1,600 for each first generation immigrant. Uh, second and third generation immigrants create a net positive of $1,700, $1,300 each. Um, total annual cost, $57 billion for first generation, but by the second generation, 30.5%, uh, uh, $5 billion positive, $220 uh, billion positive by the third generation. But again, it comes down to the way in which you look at this. I was asked to um, contribute to this study that uh, DH at Homeland Security did in 2016 to uh, measure the effect of the refugee re resettlement programs. And so, yes? So, uh, is there any way of saying, do we have any estimate of how much those same people produce for the country? I mean, this is what it costs us, but what do they eventually give to the country? Right, that, that's the second and third generation. That, that actually shows that, yeah, the second and third generation actually produces a net positive. So that's not actually costing, so that's actually going into the positive, yeah. Um, so yeah, so I was I uh, presented or uh, contributed to this report, and it showed that over a 10-year period, the refugee resettlement program had a net benefit of about 75 billion dollars. That was an 83-page report that was supposed to be used to determine how many refugees we would bring in the next year, and it was replaced with a three-page memo from the White House, which simply looked at the cost. So I looked at the first one of these categories. It said, how much does it cost to deliver services versus the native-born population? I would not accept that in any kind of accounting of a program. It makes very little sense. But that's where ideology trumps. Oh, trumps, <laughs> yes. Um, OK, I'm going to move a little bit more quickly through this. So the, um, just again, when we're thinking about immigrant benefits, um, the undocumented population, approximately 11 million in 2016. This is a serious issue. Like, it, whatever side you fall on, you know, security or all, all these other things, to have this many non-citizens within a country uh, is deeply problematic. It's deeply problematic in terms of um, what their access to, you know, kind of civic life is, resources, all of these sorts of issues. Uh, and it's especially troubling when you think about the impact on different uh, economies. 5% of the domestic labor force, 30% in service industries, 13% um, you know, of professional management business finance. Um, I also thought this is interesting. They pay approximately $12 billion in taxes at an effective tax rate of 8%. The top 1% pays an effective tax rate of 54 it's interesting to think about. 
uh, and again on relatively low incomes. So when we think about immigration today in the U.S., um, I, I like this quote by um, Portes and Rumbao, who wrote a, have written a series of books called Immigration in America. Underneath its uh, apparent uniformity, contemporary immigration features a bewildering variety of origins, return patterns, modes of adaptation to American society. Never before has the U.S. received immigrants from so many countries from such different social and economic backgrounds and for so many reasons. So immigration in the U.S. today does look different. There's different people coming in and they're going to different places. Um, I think that the way in which we sort of manage immigration absolutely has to change um, in large part because it leads to such a fragmented set of outcomes. I want to end um, just not on this, you know, everything is terrible and how horrible. Um, so instead, I want to talk briefly about this, uh, the, the case study of Syrian refugees. So Syrian refugees, as we know uh, from this terrible civil war and all of the other things that have come out of it, and it's spread people all across um, Europe and to a much, much, much smaller extent, uh, even here to, to North America. The vast bulk of Syrian refugees are in Turkey and in Lebanon. Um, a significant population in Germany and Sweden as well. Uh, in the U.S., um, so the U.S. has always been one of the bigger refugee resettlement countries, um, not by per capita, but in, in uh, absolute numbers. Um, and that was pretty stable. It kind of went up and down depending on refugee flows across the world, you know, Vietnam, um, Bosnia, things like that. Uh, it has more recently fallen off a cliff as we have had massive sort of cuts to uh, refugee inflows. Um, and you'll see there the black line is how many refugees we were supposed to take. The yellow line is how many refugees we actually took. Last year, so by the Obama administration last years, it was supposed to be about 75,000 a year. Uh, second last year of the Obama administration, there was an additional 10,000 Syrian refugees. And then in 2017, there was supposed to be an additional um, 40,000 or so. Trump administration came in, travel bans, et cetera, it just got slashed. It ended up being about 55,000 refugees overall, very, very few Syrians. Um, and we simply haven't had an um, uptick of Syrians since then. In contrast, and what I'll talk about in a moment, um, the the black line is the U.S., the yellow line is Canada. And Canada has been, again, one of the, like the U.S., one of the, the main players in refugee resettlement. Um, but the real difference we see here is in um, Syrian refugees, the, the other graphic I won't get into. So the U.S. and Syrian refugees, what we really see is an initial moment of embrace. So especially after you know all of the outpouring of of uh, kind of affect about Alan Kurdi and you know kind of what was happening to people trying to cross the Mediterranean. There were a whole lot of programs like the Rutland one that were supposed to be started to welcome in um, uh, refugees from Syria. And I saw these all across the country, lots of little programs that got started. But much like the program in Rutland, um, they got caught up in local politics, they got caught up in national politics. And then with uh, the Trump administration's cutting and cutting of, cutting of numbers, uh, two years ago it was supposed to be 45,000 refugees that were going to be um, allowed into the U.S. It's the lowest number since 1980. In actuality, less than 20, uh, sorry, just over 20,000 actually came. This year it's supposed to be 30,000. And there's no way we're going to hit that. The government shutdown and other things have all gummed up the works as well. In contrast, in Canada, what you actually had was this huge outpouring um, and this kind of desire to resettle uh, Syrian refugees. So Canada, a country a tenth the size of the U.S., ends up resettling. So the U.S. ends up resettling 10,000 uh, and maybe, maybe about 20,000 Syrians overall uh, in a two-year period. Canada, on the other hand, ends up resettling 54,560 refugees in about a one and a half year period, with a bulk in this like four month period. What's really interesting here is what they did was they had two different tiers. So there's a whole group 
that come in as government assisted refugees and that's the group that was mainly they were going to come through the regular refugee resettlement program but there was such an outcry of well how do we help what should we do that they created an entirely new it's really the bottom two columns there uh, private sponsorship program and that's where you and for friends, uh, church groups, uh, university groups, businesses, you have to put up $40,000 collectively as a group and you can sponsor a refugee. I actually think it's a really, really effective strategy. It builds on what used to be here. The, you know, the US had a private sponsorship model but it was kind of chaotic um, and that was then replaced by what we have now. But this with a lot of government assistance still in the managing and coordination of it, the privately, privately sponsored refugees, when I've gone and done a bunch of um, interviews with people, that's where I think some of the thickest sort of c social connections that you see made, where people really adopt families in, in a much more long-term uh, kind of way. So I think it's a really interesting model. So you see again here, um, Syrian refugees, uh, this was, and it was kind of a one-time thing. It wasn't like they kept doing this model. They did it this one uh, big time. And there's a lot of questions about what the impacts are and might be. There's a lot of questions about, does this leave the government off the hook for actually doing refugee resettlement? Should the government do, be doing that? Um, in the province of British Columbia, this is where I did most of my work with the immigrant and social um, settlement services. Um, it's not just that there are a lot of refugees coming in through this program, there are a lot of young refugees coming in through this program. So there are also a lot of questions about um, the specific kind of um, supports that were needed. Um, and you can't see on this map at all, but in Canada, like the US, immigrants have traditionally gone uh, to big metropolitan um, cities. It used to be called MTV, because everybody went to Montreal, Toronto, or Vancouver. Uh, but now you see here with these refugee groups, this map doesn't show you very well, but southern Ontario, lots and lots of smaller communities in Alberta, in Saskatchewan. I mean, you may raise questions about, you know, sending refugees to Saskatchewan in the middle of winter, but... Um, and I'll end with just showing uh, one of the places that is kind of a hub for bringing in these mostly Syrian refugees. So this is, again, one of the places I went to in... Vancouver. This is a new $40 million facility that had been built um, with public and private uh, resources. It's a 278-bed uh, welcome center. So people who come in there, they come in, they don't stay for more than two weeks, and then they, are, they head out to one of their the resettlement sites. But it's a fantastic integrated center. Uh, it includes a daycare, um, language classes. There's all kinds of... Uh, there's a a credit union, there, there's like um, uh, economic uh, literacy classes, they have a cooking class. Um, the apartments are clean, they're, um, they're quite spacious. Um, there's all sorts of youth focused programming there uh, and it's all in this integrated space. And it was really interesting, again, as you know, I started off um, today talking about the backlash and the fears that immigrants or refugees might engender in other people. And I thought some of the strategies that they used in this center were really interesting. So they're built by uh, Major Road and uh, the Metro Line, um, but they wanted very much to be um, accepted and integrated into this neighborhood. And so they worked quite a bit with the local uh, neighborhood. They had all sorts of interesting planning things. All the stairwells are glassed, so uh, both for sort of a sense of safety. I mean, stairways, stairwells can often uh, provoke fears, but they also um, allowed the sort of community beyond to sort of see in at least the public part of the buildings. Um, they partnered with three churches that were nearby, and they would do uh, community dinners on Fridays at one of these three churches to integrate a lot of the, the people. And again, there's both a long-term resident community there and then a short-term sort of transit community. And so they, they balance those things. Um, again, Canada is not immune to any of these sorts of, you know, right-wing populism has grown in Canada as well. There's xenophobia and Islamophobia. The, 
Um, this sign there is in reference to the, the killing of a number of men at a mosque in Quebec a couple of years ago. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the questions I asked a lot of the, the kind of people involved with resettlement, I said, what is it, a, why do you think Canada embraced the Syrian refugees where the U.S. didn't seem to as much? Um, but I actually don't think that question is right because I actually think that were, there were large parts of the American population that did. Um, and it was an interesting answer. Most people said two things. One was they were a little frustrated with how much everybody wanted a Syrian refugee, but they didn't necessarily want other refugees. Um, but the other thing they said was Canada at the time had just gone through a very divisive election and Stephen Har and a long period of uh, conservative government that had been very anti-immigrant. And some of the, the people that I talked to said they thought that this was a way for the Canadian population to express their difference, their difference and their rejection of both that and their difference um, to the U.S. Because if there's one thing that actually, there's not a lot that holds Canada together, but not being the U.S. holds Canada together. <laughs> and so I think that was one. And so we see the, the celebration right now. This is Alfonso Davies. Alfonso Davies born uh, in a refugee camp in uh, East Africa um, and now starring for uh, Bayern Munich. Um, and so there's like all sorts of stuff about see what a refugee can be. But anyway, it is a very different um, discourse about refugees that you, you still see in at least parts of Canada. So I wanted to end with that. Thank you. I was hoping you would speak a little bit about people who are immigrating for ecological reasons because of climate change. I have read about some people going, uh, for example, from India to New Zealand. You didn't see, I don't know if that's too small a group for you to talk about, but I am very interested in that. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Um, Right now, environmental refugees are not officially recognized. So you couldn't actually make that journey. I mean, that might be the reason that you're actually leaving. And certainly there's been a lot of evidence that if you were to unpeel what's going on with a lot of the conflicts in um, the Lake Victoria region in Africa, or if you were to look at you know, part of what was behind the Arab Spring that then leads to the Syrian civil war, you have massive droughts. You have you have all these other environmental issues going on, but there's been all there's been a big debate within the UNHCR, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, about whether or not environmental refugee is a legitimate concept. Um, there are entire nations, uh, so the Maldives, for example. The Prime Minister of the Maldives tried at one point, mostly as a stunt, to buy a big chunk of Australian land and say, I'm going to move my whole country there. Um, you know, and so for islands in the South Pacific, this is an existential problem. It's not like, oh, well, maybe this happens at some point. Um, but right now, we can barely deal with conflict-induced refugees. And so I think there isn't a lot of um, appetite to do that. Um, most countries will not recognize that as a legitimate. I mean, even in the U.S., the very small amount that we see is only for large-scale disasters. And what we've seen under the Trump administration is progressively each of those have been removed. So the temporary protected status has been removed. So if anything, it's been going in the other direction, that it's, it's harder to claim that kind of status. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the information about Canada. Very interesting. Um, I've heard it said, I don't know if it's true, that many people who are immigrating who enter Canada ultimately have the goal of moving to the United States. Um, historically, has that been true, that Canada has been a stepping stone to settling in this country? Mm. And uh, was that ever true? Is it true now? And any thoughts on that? Thank you. 
Yeah, I mean, I thought you were going to ask about asylum. I mean, that's the, the bigger thing that people have been talking about, the crossing the border. Um, it's a stepping stone to some degree, but people immigrate for different kinds of reasons. Um, you know, in the 80s, the Central American, you still had Central American migration, but because everybody knew that you were not going to get sanctuary in the U.S., the pathway was actually up to Canada. So Salvadorans, Nicaraguans uh, would all go up to Canada. Um, it's been more that. I, I mean, Canada and the U.S. signed a treaty a number of years ago that's called the Safe Third Country Treaty. And that treaty says that wherever you claim asylum has to be the first safe country. So you can't go through the U.S. to Canada or vice versa. You have to claim it in the first country. Um, and that's really, I mean, there's not a lot of people who go through Canada to get to the U.S. It's actually the other way around. And so, um, so that hasn't happened so much. It's unfortunate that, especially with a lot of the, the worry about the loss of the temporary protected status programs, um, what you saw was, you know, I'm sure you saw the, the news reports of all the people going up to Roxbury Road and other places and crossing the border and going up to Quebec. The irony there is, so there are people who are leaving here because the temporary protected status would get canceled here. It was already canceled in Canada. So the vast majority of people who went up there are not going to get to stay there. So, yeah. Uh, yes? Her. I'm just wondering, could you speak a bit about the humanitarian corridor that's been established over in Europe and how effective it is? Oh, yeah. I thought I was you. Oh. I thought I was using my fifth grade teacher voice. <laughs> um, I'm just curious about um, the humanitarian corridor, and some folks might not be familiar with what it is, but how, how effective is that as a strategy for trying to pe keep people out of the Mediterranean? Right. I mean, part of the problem is that um, if you talk to the, uh, the countries in southern Europe, for the most part, there is a sense that they have been used, Greece, Italy in particular, and now increasingly Spain, they have been used to create a border so that the Scandinavian countries or Germany or you know, Central Europe doesn't actually have to address the issue of migrants coming. And if anything, there's been an attempt by the, by the European nations to push the border further and further south into Libya, into other places, into Morocco, into places of emigration. There's, been the, there's actually been multiple humanitarian quarters that have been established. There's been multiple, uh, depending on the path of departure, there's also been different rules for the ships, you know, the rescue ships that go out. The problem is every time a new populist government, so when the Italian government falls and a new populist government comes in and they say, we're not going to accept anyone or as just happened today with the rescue ship, they detained the rescue ship on environmental and I think safety grounds and didn't let it go out again. So it becomes, I mean, I think the big question becomes how reliable are these corridors and how reliable do migrants themselves feel they are? Unfortunately, if anything, the more robust corridors are the ones that are operated by smugglers. And they're the ones who then sort of prey on, on people saying like, well, are you sure you can trust that humanitarian corridor? What if the humanitarian corridor is simply for them to be able to see you and then turn you back around? Far too often in the official crossings, that's what actually happens. So I don't know if that answered. Yep. Oh, yeah, sorry. I just uh, finished studying colonial revival, and this is just like the 1870s when the Irish came here because they were starving, and the people of Vermont did everything but hang them. Then the Italians came to work in the quarries, and the same thing happened. So this is nothing new. Yeah, unfortunately, there are, you know, the, there's lots of. Um, evidence that you have not just in times of economic anxiety, where the really easy answer is it's them. Somebody is doing this to you. Um, what is interesting in this particular moment is that it's not really connected, generally speaking. I mean, I've often wondered, so what happens when the next actual uh, 
economic downturn happens. I mean, this is happening in good times. This is happening in good times when people just have these kinds of fears. And those fears are irrational in lots of ways. They're not connected to something actually on the ground. Um, and we spend our time and money on the wrong thing when we really should be addressing other kinds of issues. I mean, I, I think that, you know, say what you will about the Obama, kind of the increase in immigration detention, at least that was focused on um, violent crime, which again makes, seems to make sense. It's kind of a perverse logic when you say, well, we're now going to um, take what is a civil offense of overstaying visas. We're going to make it a criminal matter. And now all these people are criminals. And that's, that's a very strange way of approaching it. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.